Welcome to the 805 Focus, where we focus on the events, topics, and people that matter to the South Coast. I'm Dominique Samario with TV Santa Barbara. And speaking of topics that matter to the South Coast, you've probably read about a very important topic recently in Santa Barbara, the proposed gang injunction. Whether you agree with the injunction or whether you oppose it, you probably have an opinion. So I'd like to welcome two guests to discuss their side of things, and they're from an organization called Poder. Please welcome Naira Pacheco and also Marissa Garcia. Thank you both for being here to discuss this. Hi, Dominic. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We're excited. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's really about having a discussion, and that's what this show is all about and what TV Santa Barbara is all about. So I really look forward to talking to you about this. Um, before we get more into the actual proposed gang injunction, I'd love to just learn more about each of you and also your group, Poder. Tell me about yourself, Naira. Um, so yeah, my name is Naira Pacheco. I have lived in Santa Barbara since I was six years old. Um, so I attended Harding Elementary, La Cumbre Junior High, San Marcos High School, um, and I'll be finishing my degree at UCSB this year. So yeah, I've been part of the Santa Barbara community and I love this community and it's, you know, like my, my home. Um, and um, I've been part of Poder since we started and the organization, the name itself, Poder, uh, stands for People Organized for the Defense and Equal Rights of Santa Barbara Youth. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And what about yourself? Um, yeah, uh, same with Nida. Um, I am um, a local native, native, born and raised here in Santa Barbara. Um, attended all the local schools. Um, and I'm really connected to this issue just because I had the opportunity to really experience the good and the bad of Santa Barbara and see a lot of things happening to my friends and, and family. Um, and wanting to make a difference. My husband is on the proposed gang injunction list and that's kind of what got me involved with Poder. Um, I've been involved with Poder for, what, since March or April? Mm -hmm. So it's been a while, but um, definitely really um, passionate. It's a great group. Um, we all really care about each other and so it's definitely empowered me to really take a stance on issues that are important to me and my community. That's great. Yeah. I mean. The number one thing um, that we encourage, and it definitely fits with your mission, is just about getting the community involved. Yeah. Whether you believe one way or another, if you are taking a stand for what you do believe in, that's really important. Exactly. So, that's great. So was this group founded, Poder, was it founded because of the gang injunction, or what kind of sparked it to come about? Yeah, definitely, and we're very um, honest about about talking about our how Poder got started. Um, and the proposed gang injunction was filed in 2011, right? So it's been a while, and our group didn't get started until last year, October of last year. Okay. So it, even though you know the injunction had been filed for a few years, um, we had been part of organizing efforts in different spaces to understand and learn more about the gang injunction. Um, but what we really saw was that there was just limited capacity on so many fronts to really be able to organize around this issue. Um, whether it was, you know, funding for organizations or just not enough people aware. Um, but those of us who, who, who kept on seeing each other at events, who kept on recognizing each other and hearing each other's stories, um, eventually we just started connecting. Um, and literally it was kind of a group of strangers finding, you know, similarities in our experiences, um, depending on the neighborhoods that we lived in Santa Barbara, and, and starting that dialogue about what are we going to do to educate our community on this issue? Because, you know, after about a year and a half of attending, you know, smaller events, but not really seeing the community that needed to be informed about the issue be present and be involved in the decision making, um, that's when we really kind of um, took that step to form this organization, this group, um, and, and try to bring that awareness. So, I think, I think too, if I might add, um, what what has been really uh, really unique, I think, about um, our efforts is 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 how the communities responded. Obviously, for me myself, I got involved because I saw other people taking a stance, and I wasn't educated on this issue at all. You know, when I when when me and my family found out about this, you know, we didn't know who to turn to, we didn't know where to go, um, and this is a lot of the similarities that we find in a lot of our families in our hardworking communities and. 
um, I know we'll get to touch base on how, how the gang injunction really does affect um, our hard working class community. But um, a lot of families uh, that we've talked to at events, um, they're, they're confused, they, um, they're looking for help, they're looking for answers, um, and they're looking for solutions. And, and we've noticed over time, you know, again, that's why I was involved, you know, I saw everything. But over time, um, it, it became, it's just all these issues came up, these big issues, people kept bringing it up. And it was something that we, we just decided we can't ignore this anymore. You know, we have to, we have to stand up for a community and we have to let our leaders know, let the city know that, hey, this is, this is our city. You know, this is, this is happening to our people. This is real. What can we do to make it better? Right. And something you um, both touched on in that is really about the education because, um, of course, with this uh, going on and it is in the news and um, I'm reading all the time things that are happening for one side or the other, I think the biggest question is, what is it? Really, I think so many people maybe have heard the headline or right. read the headline, mm -hmm. but they might not really know what it is. And so is your group is one of the efforts helping people find out more information? Yes, definitely. That's, you know, like our first priority is really to provide that education. And so a lot of folks will ask us, right, what's your elevator speech, you know, to explain <laughs> the King Injunction? And there is no way you can explain. Yeah, you can't just issue. bring that down yeah. into a paragraph yeah, almost. You can't. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's hard not to come out and say like you don't have a bias or on it because the way you explain it really matters. Um, but if I may, in essence, a gang injunction is like a restraining order. So right. it's a civil lawsuit, which means that whoever is sued or placed on that restraining order needs to uh, have a, a private lawyer defend them. They can't yeah. get a public defender to defend them because it's a civil because lawsuit. Because it's a civil lawsuit, mm -hmm. right. Um, and basically it's declaring that such people or association or individual who is being sued um, is a nuisance, and in this case is a public nuisance to Santa Barbara residents. Um, and this restraining order um, creates a space, and here in Santa Barbara it's the east side and west side, State Street, and the entire um, beachfront area, and public parks outside of these areas. Um, like Shoreline Park or Franceschi Park and things like that. Right. Um, and it says that within these areas, these individuals must abide by certain terms and conditions. Right. Um, and so going into depth, these terms and conditions include illegal activities that are, you know, no assault and battery, no violence, no stealing, a very obvious things that definitely should be uh, prohibited and are prohibited under law. Um, but it also includes legal things. So, Can you give me an example? Of so something? within the um, document, it'll say like, um, you know, no group of two or more people can be seen walking to and from um, a school center, community center, church, um, or things like that. Um, no, an individual must have um, prior written permission by the property owner if they're um, found by a police officer anywhere besides their home. Um, so these are, you know, kind of things that, that we start looking into and we're like, well, the fact that there's no specific outline on what this really means um, gives our police department a lot of discrepancy, a lot of discretion in terms of, you know, how they um, enforce these um, terms and conditions. And that's really where we begin to worry. Um, the fact that, and, you know, initially this document just provided very vague descriptions of what these terms and conditions were that it didn't exclude minors initially, um, that it included a list of 300 John Doe's, a lot of this really had us asking questions right from the beginning. And that's why we felt like it was necessary to form an organization that was completely volunteer run, you know, that no strings attached. We could be as vocal about the issue as we, we felt like being, um, and that we were comfortable asking and demanding answers for the questions that we had. I think too, um, a lot of people, um, you know, the first question they raise is, well, if they're going to be out, you know, um, doing criminal activities or or engaging in criminal behaviors, a lot of a lot of people actually think, oh, well, this is great, you know, it'll keep it'll keep everybody off the streets, and 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 gang crime will be gone, um, and that's far from the truth. And what we're concerned about, you know, obviously it's a violation of so many rights that we have as American citizens, and. That alone is disturbing. You know, the document says no walking, no standing, no sitting, no associating. 
Um, but what, it, what basically it means is you don't have to commit a crime in order to be sent to jail. But I'm gonna pause you right there. Aren't all of the people on the list previous people who have committed crimes? Is there anybody on the list who has no criminal record? There is, there is um, a couple individuals who have only committed um, offenses as minors. Okay. So as juveniles. So as minors and now they're adults. Yeah, something, okay. as, there's some that have petty um, uh, offenses like um, vandalism, um, you know, being late for curfew, things like that, that, that no, you know, normal behaviors for teenagers. And mm -hmm. as, as an adult, they've transitioned into, you know, going to school, being parents, having their families. And one of the things with the injunction is because there's so there's there's more questions than answers provided in this document. Right. But what is concerning is that you don't have to be listed as as a gang member to be put on this gang injunction list. You can it's it you can be added just by your association. And this is what we see in a lot of other injunctions down in LA, up in Oakland, mm -hmm. statewide. Um, there's a lot of testimony. People that aren't gang members are being put on this list. And so what happens is when you have this huge safety zone that encompasses so much of one community and you're telling people if you're associated that you can't be together, what's that, what, what is that going to do? It's, it's going to increase our incarceration rates. And if there is crime, it's going to be, crime's going to be pushed out of, to the safety, out of the safety zones. And so that's the other thing too is you... You know, with this tool, if, if we're going to start locking everybody up, is, is that going to solve the problem of why youth violence is happening? Maybe why? it's just taking it out of that area, you might argue. Exactly. That it's still going to happen. It just might move from those spaces. So you're not really solving the root issue. Yeah, and that's, and, that's, and that's disturbing. That's really disturbing that, you know, um, as a community, we, we aren't looking at the needs of, 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 you know, the needs to solve this. And so, you know, we've, we've presented this information to the city. Um, we've held um, forums, community events, and there's been so many suggestions. There's been so many, there's so many things going on that nobody's really listening to. You know, our community, there are people that need help. There are people that get lost in the system that need a way out. And with this injunction, it pretty much gives like a life label. So for example, my husband, who's on the injunction list, mm -hmm. he's committed crimes in the past. He has a criminal record, but that doesn't mean that he needs to carry a label for the rest of, him li rest of his life that because of his past mistakes, he will always have this life sentence. Is there a way of getting off of it? I mean, have they spelled that out at all? Is that You bring up a great mm -hmm. point about your husband. What if in five years he's done nothing? Mm -hmm. what, what would that route be, do they say? Exactly. And before that, I'll answer, uh, say that, um, mind you, the individuals who've committed crimes on this injunction list have served time or are currently serving time. So when we talk about the list of the 30 individuals mm -hmm. that, that the media and the, and the city really focuses on, a lot of the um, notions are these are the baddest of the baddest and we need to get you know, rid of them in this community, we need to address this issue. Um, because we're part of this community, because it's a small community, we are able to have contact with um, family members or friends who know about these individuals' um, past. And so what we've come to find out is that of that list of 30, 12 individuals actually remain in this community and are living in Santa Barbara. Right, and the rest so are actually, the rest are actually serving time are no longer here, serving right? Serving time in prison. Exactly. Some are serving life sentences, some have been deported, and some are serving time for whatever crimes they have committed. Right. So we see that, again, it's not like these individuals are you know, being let go or just free and not paying right. for their mistakes. Um, so what we're really talking about is focusing on 12 individuals, many of them who are students, parents, family members, and whatnot, who are trying to move forward and have no reason to continue their lifestyles because they're aging out of that period in their lives. Um, but to answer your question about the opt-out process, right. there is an opt-out clause um, within the document that was initially written. Um, but unfortunately, it's, um, it's very complicated. Um, and the way it's set up, it says that it takes three years for an individual to be able to request an opt-out okay. um, petition, which means that as long as the injunction passes these in, and this individual is named in the injunction, then they need to remain and abide by the terms and conditions of this, um, of this order. 
for three years before the competition. Um, again, they have to hire their own lawyer. So, so money that's, is a, an yes, aspect, right? exactly. Okay. And from the research that we've done in these communities, and because, again, we're part of these communities, we know that the safety zones that are described in this document um, are mainly residents of Santa Barbara who are low income. So, again, we see an issue, um, a very, very clear class issue um, in, within this issue in this uh, document as well. So I just want to take it sort of to a, a, a different level. I don't think, or maybe just to clarify, mm -hmm. you're not saying, your group isn't saying that there isn't a problem or that these people who have been tried and gone through a you know very um, well done and documented process shouldn't serve their time, mm -hmm. be punished, maybe be on probation if that was part of their sentence, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. But is it more that it, this sort of sets this precedent for maybe people in the future and or for, you know, justifying maybe discriminating against these individuals? Is it that precedent being set that you would definitely have a problem with? Exactly. We feel like um, by taking the steps to implement a gang injunction in a community that doesn't have the gang violence that larger cities have like Oakland or Los Angeles, um, which when they place gang injunctions, their gang injunctions may be a block, two, three blocks large. And when we look at ours, we're talking about almost two thirds of the city if you consider mm -hmm. the parks and the beach area that's being included. Right, right. Um, so from the, re the research that we've done, we know that this proposed gang injunction would be one of the largest in terms of area and in terms of individuals that are being included on the list. So that's a big concern because again, we feel like it's being, this gang injunction has been poorly researched um, by the people who are you know, trying to, to propose it. Um, and that's like our biggest worry, has the city really exhausted its efforts in trying everything else and trying positive and alternative solutions to help our community. And from our work in doing community surveys, um, you know, holding forums, um, you know, just interacting more with folks who, who live in these areas, we, we learn like, we learn that no, not enough has been done um, to really take such an extreme measure. What are some of those things that you've heard? What do they recommend or, or what does your group recommend I think, as alternatives? I think what's really important um, for other people to understand too is that, you know, we're not saying, oh, these poor individuals, you know, you know, like you said, we're not here saying that there's not a gang problem, that there's there's not a problem in our city. But if you look at the bigger picture and you see the people, you see the faces, you see the stories and the families, a lot of it all comes back to one root problem and it's support. It's support for our working families, it's support for our youth who have mental health issues. You know, people gravitate towards negativity when there's not a, a you know, there's not a lot of help. There's not enough love in the home. There, there, you know, there's families working two to three jobs every day and it leaves yeah. these people at home. And so a lot of the arguments have been made that, you know, all these people on this list are um, adults. You know, none of them are juveniles. Okay, so if we want to get to the root problem and s suggest solutions, where does it begin? In the it youth. begins. It right. begins at a very early age. And so, do we want to put a band aid on the problem and just hope it goes away and just and just shuffle people in and out of jails and prisons, or do we want to be different and do we want to be the city that says, you know what, we care about our people. Let's invest now before the next generation comes out because you have to look at it like a basket. So let's say there's these 30 individuals on the gang injunction list and you want to take them and pull them out of the basket and throw them in jail. Okay, here's the injunction. Let's, let's get them away. There are three youth coming in to take their place. It's a cycle that will continue. And so getting back to what we've heard in the community, we've conducted a lot of community walks um, and we've walked the safety zones. We've walked the west side, the east side. We've talked to local business owners on State Street. And one of the common themes that we hear, and this is, this is from our, our community itself, is that th they need more programs for the youth. Um, we've gone out and conducted their anonymous surveys where they fill out how they feel about their city, what can be done, and almost every single person we've talked to has said, we need to invest in our youth. There needs to be more opportunities. And while the city has done, you know, um, an amount, you know, a good amount of funding for programs and acknowledging, you know, our, our youth, I don't, we don't feel that the programs are enough. We don't feel that they're targeting the areas that they're trying to serve these, you know, um, this injunction too. 
And so one of the things we have, we have a proposal solution that we um, kind of, we went through research and we looked at the grand jury report that was given in 2008. It was right. given to the chief of police, mm -hmm. our mayor, um, our city council members, the board of supervisors, the city administrators, and the superintendent. And the number one suggestion that the grand jury report had was to invest in financial support for at-risk youth programs. And that that alone, we would feel, would be enough. It would be enough to, to tell our city, okay, how can, we, how can we fix our problem and invest in our future? And these things have been ignored, and we don't, we don't know why. Exactly. And it's just good to also remind ourselves that, yes, support is definitely you know, at the root of the solutions, but there is no one single solution. So right. it's not about funneling money into one youth program. It's about creating a diversity of programs where, you know, depending on the students' learning abilities, preferences, talents, um, they can feel comfortable in growing in that space. So we feel that until we can create communities and organizations where students of whatever preference um, to feel comfortable developing themselves, um, then we're not really targeting the root issue of violence in our communities. And, and we like to avoid that term of youth violence because it's kind of directly, mm -hmm. you know, uh, blaming the youth right. when we know there's a lot of underlying problems um, to, to why they're doing, they're resorting to these measures. And we really, um, one of like our pillars as Poder is really um, being responsible for each other as a community. So we'd like to highlight with that with everyone that we work with, that we're a community. We do this work because we love our city, we love our town, and we want to see youth prosper in whatever way they need to prosper. And with that being said about um, really taking care of each other and taking care of the community mm -hmm. at large, I mean, do you think that if there were some possible alternatives from the city or the, the powers that be, um, I mean, do you think that these people would get involved? Do you think maybe through your group now there's sort of this like pathway? Because like you said, some of these people probably were never exposed to how they could get involved. Do you feel like your group might be sort of a way to get others involved in actually being part of the solution? I think um, we've really, we've built a really strong coalition in the community. We've got a lot of really amazing people that volunteer their time. And that's one of the things that's really unique about us is we aren't funded. We, we're all volunteers. So we have devoted our time in reaching out and saying, okay, we can't provide the direct services, but we can find somebody for you that can help you. And so we've got a lot of supporters, a lot of programs, people in um, the school programs, uh, law enforcement, uh, you know, community members that have all come together and said, okay, let's get our hands dirty and let's do the work to make change. And one of the things too is our, our, our city's so beautiful. We invest so much time into making State Street look beautiful and our, our, our roads paved and trees trimmed and, and that's what we're known for. The tourist town is so beautiful. Why can't we treat our people the same way? So we're actually incredibly <laughs> getting towards the end of the show. And I want to ask some questions that have actually been asked to me. They, I said, oh, I'm doing this, this mm -hmm. program and we're having guests on from Poder. And they said, well, I'd like to know a couple of things because again, people want more information. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we really strongly believe in at least trying to provide it and or at least having them try to go seek it out and encouraging mm -hmm. that. So. Um, a question that I've been asked is, haven't they been successful in other cities before? Um, so from your research, you mentioned that you've done a lot of research when they are doing these in these other cities, like maybe Oakland or um, I think it was the city of, is it Bell um, or Echo Park, actually, they mm -hmm. said, that violence has gone down. Um, so what would you say to that? Well, you really have to consider how you define success. So if you're going to call it a success, to lock a person up um, and wait and see what happens with this person once they come out of jail. Um, for most cases that we see of individuals coming out of jail, we know that people will probably learn more about the criminal lifestyle while they're in jail than right. they will, you know, how to reform themselves. And, and right. that's, that's a fact. You know, we have a lot of people who cycle in and out of jail once they're sent after the first time. So that's a big worry for us. That's, that's not really a positive way to spend our money, um, let alone half a million dollars that's already been spent on this gang injunction. Mind um, you, it hasn't even passed yet. So it's just proposed. Yeah, and, <laughs> that's and the biggest so thing. Right. injunctions too, and um, almost every place that they're enacted, um, 
crime rates actually increase. There's research that's done, property values decrease an automatic 12 to 13 percent, and what hits the most is the local businesses. Mm. And um, so to answer your question is, does, does the injunction work? From what we're finding in other cities, it's not. In fact, it just pushes crime out. And so if, if, if any, any street that's not covered in this injunction zone, people should be worried. Okay, well, right. well I don't want the crime coming to my, my neighborhood. Let's fix it. So, no, we don't, you know, research showing that injunctions do not work. And, in fact, it, it promotes, it promotes uh, incarceration. It promotes that criminal lifestyle when somebody thinks there's no way out. So to really um, end with something positive and encouraging people to take positive action, tell me one thing that you would encourage the community to do, be it maybe research this online more or um, attend uh, a meeting or a gathering or volunteer in an after school program. What's one thing that you would recommend for our viewers to do? Um, well, definitely that. As an organization, as a coalition, we aim to create links within our community. Like Marissa said, we're not going to provide the one solution that's going to fix you know, gang violence in Santa Barbara, but we do strive to create the links of what individuals, organizations, leaders in the community can bring to the table to provide a solution. So we do encourage folks to step up in whatever skill they can share with the youth, with each other's families, to really take ownership of that and build that community that we want to see. Um, if they would love to get involved, we definitely love that back. Uh, we meet at Casa de la Raza uh, every other Wednesday, so first and third Wednesday of yeah. the month okay, good um, to know. at 6 p.m at 601 Montecito Street, and we hold our coalition meetings there, so we're always open to, to having new members come in and provide their input, and we, we love you know, really pushing that dialogue and, and having conversations, and sometimes our members won't agree on the issues, but that's what it's about, getting our hands dirty and, and, and really you know, taking this issue into our own hands. And we invite, exactly. we invite everybody that, that is um, conflicted between this injunction, people that think it's a good idea or they're not sure, like, that's okay. Like, come join us. Come talk to us. You know, we're here to educate and provide solutions. So even if you're for the injunction, but you've got some ideas on how you can help the city get safer, like, we want you. Like, we want to help. We want to build that strong community where we work together. And so the meetings, we've got all kinds of solution proposals. We've got all kinds of events that we do. We feed people. We talk to people. Like, it's all, it's all about <laughs> They're the coming love. now. You just yes. said food, so <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Food. Exactly. But no, I think it's a great point. It's all about dialogue. Mm -hmm. Whichever side you're on, it's about dialogue and being educated. Mm -hmm. So exactly. I really want to thank both of you for your time and uh, helping with that dialogue and education um, to the community. And if the viewers would like more information on Poder, they can visit them on their Facebook page. It's at uh, Poder Santa Barbara, or you can also email them. I hear they check their email very regularly, and that's PoderSB805 at gmail.com. Um, and as always, you can visit our website at tvsb.tv. You can learn more about us and all of our outreach and community programs. You can also watch lots of our programming online. So check it out. I want to thank you for watching. And I also want to thank our crew, both staff and volunteer. We could not make this happen without them. So thank you for your time. Thank you for watching. And make sure to join us next time on the 805 Focus, where we focus on the events, topics, and people that matter to the South Coast.